Let's go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll go ahead and jump into Mark. Heavenly Father, as we approach your scripture, we, we desire to always understand it to the best of our ability according to the writings and to the uh, intended audience, not only for what it meant to them, but also what it means to us. As we go through the continuation of, of, your, of your life on earth, the life of Christ, help us to be able to take in the information to properly grasp the importance of these of these uh, accounts, understand what it meant to those watching. What we have is not what they had. And even though they were eyewitnesses of those things, we are fortunate that we get to see the entire picture from a very broad perspective. Help us to appreciate that and to learn and grow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go over a few uh, reminders here. Mark, first of all, first and foremost, is a compilation of snapshots of Jesus' life recounted by Peter, written by John Mark. Um, we went over that in the introduction. In case there's like questions about that, we can go ahead and go over some of those details if you have any questions. Um, these were recorded as Peter would go out to the diaspora. Um, getting into Galatians next hour, we're going to we're going to kind of probe this out a little bit more. What it means when Paul says, um, "I have been entrusted to go to the Gentiles, just as Peter to the Jews," and we're like, "What exactly does that mean? That 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 these two individuals were the key points to both directions." And so, as Peter was going through the diaspora. Um, he was being scribed as he was speaking, telling stories about Jesus Christ. And so as they were writing these down, they're probably leaving behind some scripts. And at a certain point in time, John Mark compiles everything together and puts it in what we call the third gospel, second gospel. Ah. So this is, pri this is written primarily to the Greek-speaking Jew. Not the ones in Judea. If we want to go ahead and say who's the primary recipient of the gospel in Judea, it would probably be Matthew. Because um, it's very Judaic as far as the overall concepts and understandings. Where the Greek-speaking Jew has less of the, um, has some, but it has less of the Judaic pharisaical system in mind. This is why a lot of the things are explained in Mark. They would have little experience with what the Hebrew Jews had become, but they still have their own problems because they're Hellenistic, which means they've been Hellenized, they've been Greekified, if you will. They speak Greek, and they have fallen into a lot of the Greek culture and even the Greek philosophies. And so Mark has a lot of the uh, counteraction of the, Greeks, of the Greek uh, mythology in accordance with who Jesus Christ is. In dealing into Mark 8, as two major themes. First is the miracles, and second is Peter. We're getting into Peter next. And so when we're dealing with Peter, we have to make sure that we understand not the Peter of First and Second Peter, not the Peter of Acts 2, but the Peter of Acts 8, and how his mind kind of was, was working through some things. What we're doing here is we're trying to remember that our study is a focused on Christology. We are gathering data so that we can grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we move forward in the text, we need to make sure that we're always dealing with Christology. Who is Christ? What can we learn about him? And at the end of Mark, we're going to go ahead and kind of categorize some of the ideas that we find within the person, the humanity of Jesus Christ. Uh, Mark 8 has seven major points, feeding the 4,000, Pharisees want a sign, lessons of the feedings, unusual healings. Those four we went through last time. Today we're going to go over number five and six, Peter's confession and Peter's lack of understanding. Or if you have my notes, yay Peter, boo Peter. Yay, boo. So it's like it's, it's one of those issues you're like dealing with like, wow, that's pretty dumb. <laughs> and it's it's exactly, I think, if you read it, if you're reading it from Peter's perspective, he said these things in unison. 
And you could almost see, have you ever told a story about how just um, a brilliant you can be and how ridiculously stupid you can be? That's based kind of like what happened here with Peter. And then next week, we're going to go over this one because we're going to have to deal a little bit with theology. I want to make sure that we understand how to read the end of Mark 8 appropriately and how to save your soul because it has been misused, misapplied, misunderstood um, throughout the throughout the various different texts. I want to make sure that this particular group uh, of this body understands the end of Mark 8. We'll get to that next week. When you deal with Mark, you deal with any gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you have any connection to the Bible at all, um, I'm going to borrow what Mark Perkins said. I remember uh, Mark Perkins was here. He says, we are really um, spoiled by knowing the end before we begin. We always know what's going to happen next. You ever watch a movie so often that you can actually tell you, tell somebody what's going to happen next? And then you tell them and they're like going, really? Like, you've seen this too. I go, yes, but I always want to know if it's going to change. And so there's always this constant struggle when you're reading the Bible of just becoming mundane and slow and tired of all the just the details. So we got to put ourselves in Mark's, uh, in, in the time frame of, of Mark, the time frame of Peter's mind. And so with that, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Ah, oh, see, I got her. It's like, wait, what, what, what? Mark 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It's thinking about it. There he is. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right off the bat, Mark was writing a text giving you the conclusion. He's not saying everyone knows that Jesus is the Christ. He's telling you the end before he even starts. And it's, it's a good way to, to story tell, right? You ever ever watch a movie where they, they go to the end first? You're like, what? This is making no sense. And all of a sudden they go, 15 years previously. I think Mark 1 is basically a clip of the end of the book. And then he starts over 15 years previously with John the Baptizer. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm going to ask, I asked Sarah a question. How many times do you think the word Christ is used in Mark from this point to Mark 8? Zero. Zero. Um, Matthew mentions it all the time, but basically in, in, the, in the concept that Jesus Christ, always using it as kind of like what we would say a surname. Jesus, that is the Messiah, is how you would probably read that in Matthew appropriately. In Mark, the word Christ does not come up. He tells you Jesus is the Christ, and he doesn't mention it again until, until Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. So let's go ahead and go there. Mark 8, 27 through 30. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You're the Christ. And he warned them not to tell no one about him. I know, I didn't, I threw an extra knot in there. He warned them to tell no one about him. Now, the question and answer here within Mark, and it's also captured in, Ma in, in Matthew and Luke and John, this question and answer, is, that's how it's captured, is probably the most critical section in the Gospels. Yes, we need to understand the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's all extremely important. 
But the point of the matter of the Gospels is to demonstrate, as John says, that Jesus is the Christ. Now, it's said over and over again, but how do you get to that conclusion? How did Peter get to that conclusion? John's account may actually be a different situation, but so I'm going to go ahead and just throw it up here real quick. It's John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. And it's captured differently. Um, and basically, after Jesus said some very strange things about being the bread of life and being, you know, the, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, which was a euphemism for belief in John. Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Jesus then said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him. See, this is a consistency Peter answers, okay, because he is the leader of the 12. Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And basically that's similar to the idea of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have nearly identical accounts of this exchange. John's a little bit different. Matthew adds a blessing to Peter and a statement about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but if you kind of take that out, uh, we can go ahead and actually harmonize the three accounts into one statement. And it helps us a little bit because there's a few statements in here which need to be clarified that Mark just states, probably assuming you know that you, you understand what's happening here. So it's Matthew 16, 13 through 20, Mark 8, 27 through 30, and Luke 9, 18 to 21. Now, we're in, in, on Wednesdays, we're in Matthew chapter 12 right now. So we're going to be a little while before we get to Mark 16. So I have no problem talking about this right now because there's no spoiler alerts because I'll probably forget what I taught when I get there. So I, I'm pretty safe that I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and destroy any of the summaries of Matthew for you. <laughs> going to be a little while. So merging these accounts, we have the following rendering. And Jesus and his disciples came out into the villages of the region of Caesarea Philippi. And it came about that on the way he was praying. While he was praying, the disciples were alone with him. And he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do the crowds say that I am? But answering him, they said to him, some say John the baptizer, others say Elijah, but others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets of old has risen again. Then he questioned them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then rebuking them, he warned them that they should tell no one about him that he was the Christ. Now, that little, at the very end, this little exchange right here does not tell you not telling don't tell anybody about me don't tell anybody that i'm the christ okay so that's a very important caveat that we need to understand based upon the context uh, of mark 8 as well in matthew i skip verses 17 through 19 which contains the blessing and also a little snippet about the kingdom of heaven we'll, when we get to matthew we'll have fun with that little phrase there because it's a it's it's a it's a doozy okay the scenario is set up, right? Jesus is alone with his disciples. And if John is capturing the same account, it's the 12 only. Now, where is he? Well, beforehand in Mark chapter 8, they're in Bethsaida. Bethsaida is right here, just north of the Sea of Galilee. And they travel, not, it doesn't say to the city. It never says he goes into Caesarea Philippi. He goes, they go to the villages of the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was one of probably one of the most pagan cities in the area. Um, I don't even know if there were Jews in there. They, they, they might it, it doesn't say there wasn't or whatever, but it just, it just seems like if you actually read the history, the, it's named after the Roman Emperor Augustus and Herod Philip, the son of Herod the Great. Okay, so you have Augustus and Herod Philip, the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, not so great. That's what he called himself. No one else did. Okay. Um, who rebuilt the city. Earlier it was called Peneus, 
Peneus is a shrine, or, or it's, a, it's, a, it's a shrine for the Greek god Pan. Ever watch Pan's Labyrinth? That type of idea? No, I'm the only one? Okay. Uh, okay, okay, I got, I got one. I got one. Good movie. It's Greek goddish. Very strange. The Greek god Pan in the shrine there was located near the, near the city. And before that, it was possible that this Pan god was actually worshipped as... Baal. This was probably the center of Baal worship in Assyria. And so because the Jews scattered and, and uh, moved around a lot, and remember, they, especially during the Assyrian captivity of the northern tribes, they probably were a lot of um, Jews settled around it in the villages. So, so Jesus went probably through there twice, going to the villages. And along the way from Bethsaida, which is about 25 miles north, if you think about that, at a clip of about three miles an hour, you get there in a little over eight hours. That's that's walking at a steady pace for eight hours straight. I'm not sure about you. I don't know. You know, that's, that's, that's tough, okay? Could they do it in one day? Probably. But probably more than likely, they broke it up. Just a, an idea. Why do I say that? Because Jesus was praying, captured in the loop. Jesus went off to pray. Along the way, he stopped and went to pray. And if you ever read the accounts of Jesus when he's praying, where is he? He's not stopped in, he's not like in the room with everybody. You know, he's not, okay, let's go camp out and he's praying within the, he's, he's gone off. But this time, he takes the 12. He takes the 12 with them and he's praying. Now, he does this also at a very important time in his life, which is when? The Garden of Gethsemane. He takes the 12 into the garden, and he tells the, the, he tells eight of them to stay, I had to count, three of them to come closer, and then they stop, and then he goes off a little farther and prays. This is watch. They don't. They all fall asleep. So... You have two instances where Jesus goes off to pray with his 12, 11 in Garden of Gethsemane, where it seems to be very pinnacle within the Gospels. So if you were to read the Gospels, you would read it kind of building up to a climax, and this, this proclamation of Peter saying, you are the Christ, you are the Holy One of God, is pinnacle number one. Everything before that was leading up to this point. And then from that point, it kind of dips back down again, and there's going to be opposition, and then that's going to be you know, furthering issues. Jesus is going to give him a little more information, telling him about the way he's going to die. And then the next pinnacle is the Passion Week, the cross. And, of course, three days later, the resurrection. So you have two peaks of information and we, we read Mark, we read Matthew, we come to this, and we go, and we miss the, the climax of the situation. This is so important that we have to take time to stop and go, what exactly just happened here? Because as I said before, this is the first time Christ is used since Mark 1.1. And that's very important. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, he asked the crowd, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, they say, Elijah. I remember, if you kind of harmonize it, Jeremiah. One of the prophets of old has risen again from the dead. And it's like, so the crowds basically have no idea who you are. This is not the first time they've made this mistake, right? Mark chapter 6, just a few chapters back, what do the crowd say? Now, this is kind of like the rumor that hits Herod's ear. And King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known. And people were saying, John the baptizer has risen from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are working him. But others were saying, he is Elijah. And others were saying, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. So the crowds are hearing about Jesus. They're following Jesus. 
and they're curious about Jesus. He's a prophet. He's he's Elijah. They don't know. They, they have no idea who he is. They're not taking in the information well. When King Herod heard of it, he kept on saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen. He's paranoid. Jesus then clarifies this and says, who do you say that I am? Who is my true identity? We, I, we, we all know I'm not that. We know John the baptizer. I've already told you he's Elijah. So I am not Elijah. So who am I? Peter responds, you are the Christ. Now Christ is the word Christos. And just in case you need to be reminded, this is important. Christos does not mean Christ. That is transliteration. When you say Christ, you're speaking Greek. Christos means one that is anointed. In Hebrew, the word Messiah, Mashiach, also means one that is anointed. These two words are synonymous. One is Hebrew, one is Greek. If you were to translate this properly into English, you should probably translate it, you're the anointed one. That has an implication from the Hebrew text, from all of the different uh, prophecies of old. Going for the prophets, going all the way back to Genesis about the promised one. Peter was saying that Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Hebrew text. Now, I, we're going to go ahead and take a little trip through Mark a little bit here, okay? So, of course, we've already read Mark 1.1, 1, 1, and let's look for Christ in Mark. And let's see how many times it's used. Let's see how it's used, and then we'll make a few observations. First, Mark 1.1, 1, 1. we've already read it, go it again, very simple. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. After Mark chapter 8, verse 29, it goes to Mark 9.41. Mark chapter 9, verse 41. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of the anointed one, of Messiah, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Now, interestingly enough, okay, if you read the context, Jesus is not saying, I am the Christ. He simply, if he gives you a drink of water because you are promoters of followers of the Christ, they will not lose their reward. The next time Christ is used is Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. Jesus is in the temple. This is Jerusalem. This is coming up to the, uh, the final week. And Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said the, in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath my feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the crowd, crowd enjoyed listening to him. Wow, that's a great question. Is he saying anything about himself in, the, in that context? No, he's not saying anything about himself. The next time Christ is used is Mark chapter 13, 21 through 23. And this is dealing with the kind of the tribulational, um, this, the, the, the discourse at Mount Olive. The Olivet Discourse. And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there. Do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. He's warning them. There's going to be people saying at the end times, there's the Christ. Don't believe them. 
That's not how it's going to happen. And I told you everything in advance, so you're warned. Anything here about Jesus claiming to be the Christ? The Messiah? The Holy One? Hmm? Next one is Mark chapter 14, 60 through 64. This is the trial of Jesus Christ. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus. After some false accusations that were unsustainable, they wanted Jesus to answer for himself. Do you not answer? What is these men saying, testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does this seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Here, we have a clear statement. When does this occur? The eve, or the very early morning, before his death. How many times is it recorded in the book of Mark that it is stated plainly that Jesus is the Christ? Mark 1.1, 1, 1, Mark 8, Mark 14. But I thought the book was written so that they would believe that he is the Christ. Yes. So how was that accomplished? Mark 15 is the final one, 29-32. This is done in mockery. He's on the cross. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe those who crucified with him were also insulting him. This now leads us to a question that we have to be very observant about. Is Jesus proclaiming that he is the Messiah in the Gospels? You know the answer. We already went through it. Answer is no. He is not proclaiming it. People figure it out, but he is not proclaiming it. And I find that absolutely fascinating. Wouldn't you want, I mean, if you were the Messiah, wouldn't you say, come down, you know, first step on the scene after your baptism, come out of the water. I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one. Believe in me so that you may have life. Wouldn't that be the first thing you would say? He doesn't. Very interesting. It comes out, but the proclamation in the Gospels, specifically the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, John is more of a commentary on, on Jesus' life rather than a collection of, 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 um, of the historical narrative. But in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the proclamation is about what? You remember from our study so far? What is the proclamation of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? The kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom. Kingdom. That's, the, that, that's what it is. Now, what do you have to have to have a kingdom? You have to have a king. But he doesn't say, I'm that king. In fact, he is repeating the same message of who? Who started the message? John the baptizer. They had the same message. When John went into prison, Jesus took up the mantle and said, I'll go ahead and continue the message. Why? 
Think of the Old Testament and think of all the attributes of God. Omniscient. Omnipotent. Wise God. Immortal God. Invisible God. Right? What attribute does Jesus capture that is not stated in the Old Testament as God? I saw a mouth move. Anyone over here? It's humility. You see, the, the one problem you have is that self-testimony is not evidence. This is not a rule that, 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 um, that Jesus is just abiding by for the Jews. This is his rule. So in the situation that we have, about Peter's statement. Peter did not come out and say that Jesus said Jesus said he was the Christ. Peter figures it out. Uh, I don't have the, the verses on my on the screen here. If you will say so you have your Bibles, turn over to John chapter eight. This is a light edition, and I missed to put it in the slides. John chapter eight. Verse 12. John captures Jesus' words as he's ramping up the evidence. Okay? It's John 8. It's not John 1, right? John 1 says Jesus was the light of the world. It doesn't say that Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, then Jesus spoke to, the, to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisee said, said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. It's a well-established principle from the law of God that self-testimony about who you are and what you what your, your truth is or not the I don't have, I said that completely wrong. I get mixed up watching YouTube videos. What his, what the truth is about yourself is not evidence. You have to have other people corroborate those information. But if you go back to John chapter 5, verses 30 through 39, we see Jesus know this about, about the how evidence is mounted and how you have to prove something. Jesus begins by saying, I can do nothing. Verse 30 of John chapter 5. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge because my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. It's not, it's part of the character of God. You cannot self-testify. So when Jesus does not say, I am the Christ, people go, well, he didn't even claim to be the Christ. You're right. Well, there's a time in which he answers the question at the end, but the evidence is already mounted. There is another who testifies of me, and I know the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning, and while shining, you were willing to rejoice in his, in, for a while in his light. John the baptizer says, said, what about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And people are like, what do you mean? What do you mean what I mean? It's pretty plain. John said it plainly. Verse 36, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. I am the one sent. I am the Holy One of God. I am the anointed. The Father who sent me, he has, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen him. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who he sent. 
Who is the who is the one who is sent? If you don't believe Jesus, so you're not hearing the Father, and also the prophets of all, of old as well. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is in these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. So you have the witness of scriptures, the witness of the Father, witness of works, and the witness of John. All of that there should have been enough without any word of Jesus Christ and what he claimed. He gave a message. He did the works of Messiah. He had the message of Messiah. He had the testimony of other people to demonstrate that he was the Christ. And who figures this out? Dumb old Peter. Peter, the, 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 the constant foot and mouth Peter, says, you're the Christ. And Matthew then, Jesus uh, gives a blessing in, in, uh, to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, which says, Because, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now there's a question about this when we get there. My conclusion before we get there is that Peter figured out the testimony of others and the works of Jesus Christ and how those testify about him. He did not come out and say, I am the Christ, but Peter figured it out. And in Mark chapter 8, this profound statement is made so that the people can understand. You will read in Mark and go, wait a second, did he ever claim to be the Christ? It says it in Mark 1.1. 1, 1, but from that point on, it doesn't say, I'm the Christ, but Peter said, you're the Christ. And he warned them, do not tell anyone that I am the Christ. Why is that? Well, it's a, it's a common practice. We don't understand this. His message was that of preparation for the kingdom of God. Proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah would have caused the confrontation with the Sanhedrin early. His time had not yet come. The proclamation that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and here's the king, um, that would have started a war. And Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. How do I know that? Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He was sitting, he was stating the matter plainly. This again, you read that verse and then you go back to the, the, the crucifixion and the and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you go, What is wrong with these people? Why wasn't Peter at the tomb? You think he would have made a made a tent and just camped out there and waited. No. And even afterwards, didn't figure it out. But turning around and seeing his disciples, so it was sorry, and Peter took him aside. I forgot that part. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke. You, you just said he's the Christ. And then he began teaching, I'm going to go die and rise again. He goes, you, No, you're not. What is wrong with you? I know it's wrong. He's just like every other person during that time. We're looking at it knowing Mark 1 and Mark 16. We know it reading Genesis and Revelation. We know it because we got the, the entire epistles. We get all the information at once. Peter is in, the, is in the moment, figuring it out as it happens, and it's not that easy. We can make fun of him now. It's a little, little punches, little jabs. Of course, when we get there, he's going, well, really? You had that entire book and you couldn't figure it out for a while? <laughs> Imagine me and me. But still, it's like it's still one of those. I go, and again, don't take rebuke as kind of like negative, you know, shame on you, Jesus. It's more like, no, this is no, this is not the way. You're the Messiah. You're supposed to what? Conquer. So he speaks plainly about what to do. Peter rebukes Jesus, and then he says, No, Peter, you're not thinking properly. You're thinking like Satan. You want the way of the world. You have your own interest in mind. You're not thinking after God's thoughts. I don't think that needs much explanation. That's very clear in what he says here. 
But again, let's make sure we understand why would Peter understand and state that Jesus is the Christ, but then tell Jesus that he was not going to die? Because Peter did not understand the prophecy and responsibility of the Christ. To close, turn to Luke 24. After Jesus' Passion Week, after Jesus' various different discourses to the apostles, upper room discourse, his cock in the Garden of Gethsemane, the death on the cross, the resurrection occurs, and they're still not fully understanding. My assumption here is that they've already had a few conversations with the risen God. And they're still trying to figure this out. Luke 24, 21. But we were, so this is the road to Emmaus. Jesus, kind of like disguising himself, is walking up with two. Now, it's suspected that one of these individuals is Peter. Suspect. Doesn't say that. We were hoping that it was he, Jesus, so I'm not sure who's talking here. But let's go ahead and put Peter here, just, just to have fun with it. Peter saying, we were hoping that Jesus was going to redeem Israel. And indeed, indeed, besides all these things, it's the third day since these things happened. But also some woman among us were amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went. So no, not Peter. It can't be Peter. I don't know what these people are talking about. No, not Peter. Rereading it again, not Peter. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the woman who had said, that's Peter, went to the tomb. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Then another appearance in Luke 24, 44. That's Luke 2. <laughs> Luke 24. Like, what in the world? It's supposing to be in the caravan. That's not right. Luke 24, verse 44. Now he said to them, that is uh, the disciples as well, the, the entire 11. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all these things are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. They still, after the resurrection, had to be taught by Jesus directly that this is how it had to be. It took 40 days dealing with the resurrected Jesus Christ for them to figure this out. And even then, I don't think they really get it until they receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. It's hard. In the Gospels, our understanding is that Jesus is the Christ is taken for granted as we read. We, we know the answer already. We don't discover with them. It's hard for us to do that, but it's something that we need to understand and appreciate. Jesus did not self-proclaim, but let others testify about him so that the claim of Jesus being the Christ was validated correctly in accordance with the law of testimony. That is so important for us to understand because we always think, why isn't Jesus just, here I am. Why isn't he doing that? Because it wouldn't be true. That's not the way that God has set up how you testify about yourself. I hope this helps you understand exactly how important that passage is and exactly what we've been understanding from Mark and Christology and the humility of Jesus Christ. It's not self-promotion. It's doing the will of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, for all that you've done for us. It's, it's truly amazing to take... The, 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 the trip with the disciples and allow us please to, to empty our minds of our pre preconceived notions and the spoiler alerts. Let us understand as they understood. Go through the realm of discovery to understand your testimony written by your apostles and prophets that you are the Christ. We pray that everyone here has come to that realization as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.